All right, good afternoon, everyone. So um, by the way, um, I would like to thank in advance for all the participants who participated for this event. This is a very um, important event for both university, you know, from um, Universitas Bayangkara, Jakarta, Raya, and also from the University of Mindanao in forging this partnership. Now for today's afternoon, we will be having a discussion or a lecture about utilizing data-driven decision. And then, um, and we will be, um, of course, as you can see in our screen, we have our two distinguished speakers who are most qualified more than anyone else to talk about their respective topic. And um, with that, um, may I request everyone to please pay respect and attention to the Philippine National Anthem to be followed by the National Anthem of Indonesia. Hello, Ish. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just want to check. Um, Bayang magiliw pera sa silangan na alam ng puso sa dede boy buhay. Lupang hinirang duyan ka ng magiting sa malulupi. Di ka pa sisigil. Sa dagat at bundok, sa simuya, sa langit ng baga May dilagang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal Ang isap ng mataw at mo'y tagumpay na nagnenege Ang bituin na taro niyang kailan pa may di magdidilim Lupa ng araw ng walang ipagsinta Buhay ng isa piling mo Ang iligayo ng pagmay mga pirang mamatay ng dahil sa'yo. Good afternoon, everyone. So again, I would like to welcome you to our International Collaborative Lecture Series um, in partnership with the University of Mindanao as well as um, from the Universitas Bayangkara Jakarta Raya. 
Okay, and also would like to welcome you for today's event. So for all our attendees, for over 100 attendees here in Zoom, and also for those who are streaming live in our YouTube channel, who can be found in our um, official YouTube page of the University of Mindanao. So with this, while, uh, while we're trying to fix some of the um, unforeseen events for technical difficulties, I would like everyone to witness the president's report of the University of Mindanao for a moment. Okay, there you go. All right, so again, as I have mentioned a while ago, the theme of for today's um, event is utilizing data-driven decisions. So to formally open and welcome our distinguished guest for this afternoon um, to deliver her opening remarks, we have here the Vice President for Operations for Digas um, Campus. She is one of our operations um, VP here in the, one of the branches here in the University of Mindanao, Dr. Tessie Miralias. A warm up, a virtual warm of applause, please. Assalamu alaikum, salamat siyang. Our warm and cordial virtual afternoon greetings to the highly esteemed academic officers the Vice Director for Academic Affairs, Professor Tatang Eri Gomante, Vice Director for Cooperation and Information Technology, Dr. Dia Ayo Permatasari, the Bureau Chief of Cooperation and International Office, Dr. Suharte, Dean of Engineering Faculty, Dr. Ismania, Vice Dean for Academic Affairs of Engineering Faculty, Dr. Engineer Edno Joho Simito. To all the deans, the vice dean, the study program head of economics and business, law, education, computer science, communication, and psychology, the faculty and staff and students of the Universitas Bayangkara Jakarta Raya, Indonesia, as well as to the University of Mindanao counterparts. I am pleased to welcome you all to this international collaborative lecture series hosted by the two universities. The recent lecture sessions delivered by the expert speakers covering varied, relevant, and very interesting topics across disciplines have provided us the intellectual tools and necessary updates on the current trends of the subjects taken up in the previous discourses. As the world transitions to digitization accelerated by the pandemic, wide opportunities unfold also before us. UM's aggressive internationalization pursuits spearheaded by the Office of External Relations and International Affairs with our very dynamic and exceptional Vice President, Dr. Reynaldo Castro at the helm, and our partnership with Universitas Bayangkara Jakarta Raya has been very fruitful and rewarding. Though we miss the old normal way of doing things, nonetheless, we are up in our engagements. This time, the webcam is our window to the world. Indeed, the COVID-19 has disrupted education all over the world in a large scale never seen before. Yet, we are arming ourselves. And this international lecture series program is just one of the many concrete actions being undertaken by both UBJ and UM. The huge challenges are there glaring, pressing us to continuously create, reinvent, innovate, to be agile in addressing the evolving needs of our clients or our students and solving learning gaps and losses. For in all circumstances, with the strength and wisdom from above, we stand committed to our vision, mission and values and sustain quality, inclusive, transformative education. This afternoon's lecture on utilizing data-driven decision is apt and astute, considering that to make informed decisions based on latest data is becoming the mainstream norm, not only in the academia, but also in the business sector and in the government agencies. Moreover, this, in this volatile and fast-changing world, we have to train ourselves to become data-driven, keep an analytical mind, not only in our institutions, but even in our personal lives. So let us be inspired and get hooked on the topics to be delivered to us by our brilliant speakers. I am excited and I'm sure you are too. Thank you and good day. Thank you very much, Dr. Miralios, for that very insightful and very um, 
positive um, welcome to all of our participants and to all our guests. Okay, so indeed, um, regardless what we are in now in the darkest time, we are always finding opportunity despite of any adversities that came along in our way, especially this pandemic, and of course to ignite resiliency for both not just here in the Philippines, but also in Indonesia. And because we are, no one is susceptible with this pandemic. Now, I am very honored to formally start our program with our first um, speaker. He is a renowned um, economic professor and also our dear, dear dean of the College of Business Administration and Economics. He is also the program coordinator of um, business allied courses in our professional schools everyone please help me welcome our first um, speaker to discuss entrepreneurial opportunity recognition based on analytic hierarchy process dr vicente salvador montano good afternoon dean yes yes and good afternoon to all yeah. can, can, can i share that Can I share now my uh, uh, PowerPoint? Yes, uh, yes, Dr. Montaña, you may. Uh, can you see my uh, material slide? Can, can you see it? Yes, Dean. Okay. So pleasant good afternoon to all, especially to Dr. Tatang Dumandi, Dr. Wisari, Dr. Sumatri, and uh, Dr. Islia. It is uh, my pleasure to present to you as a, uh, one of the presenter in this uh, joint international lecture series between the University of Mindanao and the Universitas Bayangkara, Jakarta. It reminds me that uh, we both share a glorious past since the uh, Philippines and Indonesia were once part of the majestic Majapahit Empire. So this remind, remind me that people from all areas in uh, Southeast Asia were then freely able to exchange goods, and freely able to extend felicitation to each other. And now at present, we are confronted with one of the greatest challenge, not only here in Southeast Asia, but also in the world, wherein we are experiencing collectively the COVID-19 crisis. So in my uh, presentation entitled Entrepreneurial Opportunity Recognition for Business Survival and Analytical Hierarchy Process Analysis, we'd like to investigate what are those or what is the factor that uh, really determined the survival of small, medium enterprise here in Davao City? So let me start my presentation. So it, it is divided into several parts. We have the introduction, objectives, theoretical framework, method, result and discussion, and then Conclusion. In the first part, in the uh, introduction, we are aware that the small and medium enterprise are the significant drivers of employment and economic growth and catalyze innovations. SME, particularly, accounted for 99% of the registered business in the Philippines, and they provide 60% of the jobs. In the recent study, or survey that was conducted by the ITC, WTO, United Nations, and the Department of Trade and Industry on COVID-19 business impact survey, it revealed that most or all 99% of the SMEs were affected by the pandemic. Further, the adverse effect were universal. So namely, the uh, impact on business were Experience in lower sales, 88%, lack of inputs, 86%, difficulty in logistic services, 46%, and 
and uncollected account receivable 33%. Despite these challenges, resilient enterprises managed to ride through the wave of the pandemic. A third of interviewed SMEs adopted strategies such as adopting sales mix using the online platforms or seeking new suppliers. The capacity of SMEs to survive pinpoint to their ability to seek or identify opportunities that survive their resilience and competitiveness. So therefore, against the economic crisis, the capacity to recognize entrepreneurial opportunities is the primary, primary prerequisite for survival and performance. The initial step in the entrepreneurial process is the identification of these opportunities. Hence, opportunity recognition is essential and in its absence, no entrepreneurial action can occur. So SMEs required a more profound and a broader understanding of how opportunities are valuable with the factors influencing the opportunities. An entrepreneur wanting to increase the probability of identifying profitable opportunities need a clear understanding of the factors that affect opportunity recognition process. So moving on, we have here the key to survival process. So the entrepreneurial process is a series of opportunity utilization, opportunity exploitation, and opportunity identification. Identification and or identifying and evaluating the opportunity for business is essential. The initial process of entrepreneurship starts with the identification and continuous exploitation of opportunities. The potential value of an entrepreneur's opportunity and inherent abilities exert a considerable process to become definitive for opportunity strategy orientation. So these processes are called opportunity identification or recognition. So therefore, this study. So this study attempted to contribute to the entrepreneurship literature by introducing new information for understanding how entrepreneurs manage to survive despite the current COVID-19 crisis, identifying entrepreneurial opportunities. Thus, among the certain personal characteristics associated with an entrepreneur and opportunity identification, which of the following? These are the characteristics that were identified as inherent to the entrepreneurs for them to be able to recognize opportunity in their environment. So these are self-efficacy, prior knowledge, social network, perception on the business environment opportunity, individual level innovation, performance weighted heavily on the survival of the entrepreneur. So our study or my uh, presentation will uh, solely focus on what is that single factor that entrepreneurs able to survive the uh, COVID-19 and continue to survive. What is that ultimate factor that they consider contributed to their current survival to the COVID-19 crisis? So based on the uh, theoretical framework of my study, the uh, theoretical framework is uh, based on the uh, study of uh, Donald Campbell in which uh, he advanced the evolutionary realist which is based on uh, which proposed that individual may construct opportunities through the endorsement of others through social cross validation so this was the third force this is what we call the third force because the first two theory that they advanced was the theory on realist, and the uh, second was the theory of constructivist. So the basic nature of opportunities 
is a subject that arises much debate in the area of entrepreneurship, which covers both theoretical and empirical research on opportunity identification. The debate arises from basic differences in philosophy of science, realism, and constructionism. With these differences, a theory on, uh, on what they call evolutionary realism emerged as the auspicious approach for uniting the difference between realism and constructionism. So presently, the uh, realist perspective dominates studies in entrepreneurial opportunities. So they say that it is really the ability of the entrepreneur to identify in the uh, environment opportunity that enabled them to survive. And this uh, opportunity is explained in the uh, theory that they call realist. So realist is the theory that dominates the uh, ability or uh, try to explain the ability of entrepreneurs to identify this opportunity. So based on uh, economics, the potential for creating new economic value characterized the realist perspective, which result from imperfect competition. So the opportunities based on Scampeter and uh, Kisnerian appear during the exogenous shock to the present economic market, which increases the chances to offer new goods and services in a new way. So they said that the uh, current COVID-19 crisis that brought economic crisis in all in our world economy is what they call a uh, external shock or what they call an exogenous shock. And because of this exogenous shock, it reconfigure the uh, business landscape. And upon reconfiguring of the business landscape, it created new opportunities. So this is what they call the realist. Now, contrary to the uh, perspective of the uh, realist, in which they say that opportunity is an external factor, contrary to them is the constructivist. So the, what is the uh, theory that's being advanced by the constructivist? So the constructivist perspective on opportunity advances that ambiguity and equivocal information characterize opportunities. Also, opportunities are not objective. Instead of when entrepreneurs recognize opportunity in the environment and provide the meaning unique from others' interpretation. So if on the part of the realist, they say that opportunities are created in the external environment, the constructivist said that it depends upon the entrepreneur to identify these opportunities. So in other words, the constructivist view opportunities as subjective. So if an entrepreneur cannot recognize this opportunity, therefore they cannot act on this opportunity, contrary to the belief of the realist. So the concept suggests that opportunities only exist when people act to create them. The concept of opportunity assumes a previous understanding of opportunities and threat, therefore opportunity is subjective, an outcome of entrepreneurs, interpretation of the environment and acts based on the result of their interpretation. So there is a uh, 360 departure on both the realist and constructivist. So the realist said that opportunity is an external occurrence, so which make it objective, while the constructivist says that it depends on the point of view of the entrepreneur. So therefore it is subjective. So different or researchers propose different ways to unite the basic differences between realism and constructivism in entrepreneurship. A uh, taxonomy of opportunity identifies evolutionary realism that covers both realist and constructionist or constructivist perspective. The approach presented the opportunity in a multiple identifiable forms spanning from relatively objective to subjectively 
construct, constructed. So most of the existing literature on the entrepreneurial opportunity considers the realist and constructionist or constructivist as incompatible. So at most, the most the, the two points of view present a different fundamental event. However, the third perspective in which this study is based on is what we call the evolutionary realism. So based on the expert, based on their study, they said that uh, the uh, point of view of the realist and the point of view of constructivist are irreconcilable. However, there is now this third uh, theory or a third option in which they say that these two are or can be amalgated, which means that they can be joined together and they call it the evolutionary realism. So what does the uh, point of view of this third force, which is the evolutionary uh, realism or uh, what they call the evolutionary realist? So they say that they propose that individual may construct opportunities through the endorsement of others through social cross validation. The study of uh, Alvarez, Barney, and Young in 2010 agreed that evolutionary realism consider opportunity as an independent of individual action. However, integrating a realist perspective, the individual action is established based on the objective reality of validity. Though markets are socially constructed, the market reaction is perceived as a check on opportunity validity. So the evolutionary realism or those that advance this jury who are called evolutionary realists are advancing that both the realist and the constructivist, they are both right. So they say that the opportunity emerged from the external environment, but it is up to the entrepreneur to act on this opportunity. So for instance, an entrepreneur identified an opportunity to create value specific in a market, but the financial sponsor may agree or disagree that it is a legitimate opportunity. In this case, the decision of the financial sponsor becomes a mechanism for validating opportunities. So the potential customer also assume a similar, a similar role. Opportunities continue to be validated to the degree that relevant players perceive them to be so. Moreover, opportunities are purely creative ideas that have been examined through evaluative processes. So let's now move to the method that I have used in order to verify the evolutionary realist or realism. Okay, so this is the uh, third force, the evolutionary realism. So in the uh, method, so deciding in the absence of an obvious best answer make the decision process complex. So basically people sometimes follow their intuition or refer to their past experience. Other may seek expert advice to weigh the advantages and disadvantages of their decision. Other technique that help process information and recommend decision is the analytical hierarchy process. So the, uh, the, the technique that I have used in order to uh, verify the uh, uh, evolutionary realism is the analytical hierarchy process. So since uh, one of the weakness in uh, most researches is to present the uh, level of importance among the entrepreneurs based only on the descriptive evaluation. So however, if you're going to apply the analytical process technique, we might be able to delve much farther from the quantitative information that the entrepreneurs or the respondents are able to supply to us. So that is the uh, strength of the analytical hierarchy process. So the uh, analytical hierarchy process or what they call 
AHP recommend decision. So if there is no clear best choice, the uh, AHP method compares multiple alternatives that contain several criteria to help the best option. So also based on importance, the method is hierarchy system of ranking various choices against each other. So the AHP is a combination of math and uh, psychology to compare several alternatives and choose the best through pairwise comparison, which is comparing two criteria at a time. In this manner, choosing is made more accessible. So the uh, AHP went beyond the uh, descriptive analysis of our data. So it went through a pairwise comparison in which the several characteristics that were uh, previously presented, several characteristics of entrepreneur that they consider are factors in which these factors enable entrepreneurs to survive in the uh, COVID-19 crisis the uh, respondent or the entrepreneurs are asked to select between and among these factors. So the uh, AHP also used the uh, linear algeb algebra, which is a type of mathematics. I'm sure that you're aware of that. Used to calculate the importance of criteria using the matrices to evaluate the result of each pairwise which assigned weight. So the uh, methodology that, uh, that is used, which is a standardized process for the analytical hierarchy process is to identify our criteria. So these are the factors that I, were identified. And then we proceed with the pairwise comparison process in which there were 15 pairs. And then we proceed with the uh, calculation or weight of each criterion based on the uh, ranking of uh, importance that the entrepreneur or respondent have expressed in those pairwise comparison. And then we have a uh, weight of each criterion. And then finally, through uh, the uh, quantitative technique, we're able to distill the uh, best option that the entrepreneur able to identify. So this is a definition, rating, calculation, and check. So in the last two process, which is the data analysis, contain the calculation and check. So the instrument that was used in this study was adopted. The researcher sent in the email the questionnaire covering a brief description of the study and declaring confidentiality of the data data gathered. So the web survey was the most convenient technique to adhere to the Philippine Interagency Task Force or the IATF protocol against the spread of COVID-19. Since we are not yet allowed to uh, conduct a, a physical survey, so the uh, investigator or the researchers uh, distributed this uh, instrument through emails and uh, requested the uh, respondent to answer the instrument and uh, return this instrument to us. So the researcher adopted the survey instrument from the study entitled Entrepreneurial Opportunity Recognition and Empirical Study of R&D Personnel. Okay, so moving on, we have here the uh, parts of the uh, instrument. So the instrument was uh, con contextualized, the adapted con uh, instrument was uh, contextualized based on the current economic conditions. The adapted questionnaire was divided into two parts. The first part was uh, further divided into three sections. The first section of the first part is on the perceived situation of the respondent on the state of their business compared with their peers. So. Take note that these entrepreneurs are still existing or their business are still existing. So they're able to manage for uh, more than a year of the uh, different level of quarantine uh, situation. 
and they're able to manage or their business was able to survive. Unlike some of their peers were forced to close and declare bankruptcy for their business. So the respondent in this survey are those uh, entrepreneurs that were able to continue their business despite of the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So the second section was on the uh, self-efficacy, prior knowledge, and social network measure. And the third section was on entrepreneurial opportunity recognition measure and perception about the industrial environment on opportunities measures. So in the uh, first part, the responses were five point Likert scale. This is the descriptive survey. And then the second part is the pairwise comparison of all indicators which the respondent indicate the intensity of importance on absolute scale between nine, indicating an extremely more important criterion, and uh, one, indicating both criterion are equal in pairwise scale description were illustrated in table one. So this is our uh, fundamental uh, scale. Uh, this was uh, developed by uh, Saati in 1987, who pioneered the uh, analytical hierarchy process. So between uh, two uh, factors that uh, the entrepreneur considered to be uh, critical on their uh, business survival, if they're going to rate it one, so both factors have an equal importance. But if they're going to rate it at nine, so it means that one factor is extremely important compared to the other factor. So that is the uh, SAT instrument. So let's now uh, go into the result in the discussion of the uh, survey. So there were 30 respondents of the, uh, of the uh, survey. And uh, based on the descriptive uh, statistics, the uh, respondent or the entrepreneur say that when it comes to revenue over the past year, which means uh, the past three years, compared to their peer, uh, similar businesses, uh, the other uh, known acquaintances who also have uh, businesses on their own, they say that their uh, revenue compared to their peers is considered to be high. Now, when it comes to their industry experience, so the uh, respondent and this respondent are the one that survived, uh, able to uh, survive during the COVID-19 crisis, They're able to continue their business. They say that their industry experience compared to their peers is also high. And then uh, when it comes to their uh, learning hours outside their business, they say compared to their peers, their learning hours is high. Now, when it comes to the number of employees that they have in their business, compared to their peers, they say that they only employ a moderate level of uh, number, a moderate number of employees. So, meaning to say that it is not too many and it is not too few compared to their, compared to their peers. So, so moving on, so in uh, terms of the descriptive ratings, the uh, double entrepreneurs, based on their descriptive rating, rank first the perception about their entrepreneurial environmental opportunities or their perception on the uh, environment, the uh, possible entrepreneurial opportunity available in their environment. So they rank it based on the descriptive, which are the means and the standard deviation, they rank their perception ability to perceive environmental opportunities, so which means external environment as the uh, number one uh, reason for them to be able to survive. The second one is their uh, social networks, which means that uh, the number of peers that they have, the depth of their uh, social networks is the second attributes uh, why they were able to uh, uh, survive in the uh, COVID-19 crisis. 
And the third, according to them, would be their self-efficacy. We need to say their uh, confidence on, their, on themselves, the confidence on their ability to be able to withstand all the challenges that the uh, present crisis offered them, offered to them. So this would be the uh, descriptive rating. Now, after the descriptive rating, there is that second, as a second part of the uh, instrument in which the uh, respondent were asked to compare the factors. For example, self-efficacy against prior knowledge, self-efficacy against social network, self-efficacy against so on and so forth. Uh, they were asked to rank the uh, importance between the two factors. Now, curiously, the result was a little bit different. So when we proceed to the pairwise compa comparison using the uh, analytic hierarchy process, there is a very interesting uh, result. So contrary, uh, the result of the analytic hierarchy process showed that the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition has the heaviest weight in the business survival of the entrepreneurs. So looking into the, uh, looking into the weight, we can uh, see here in the, uh, in the presentation that more than 40% of the uh, business survival using the uh, AHP analysis, the uh, entrepreneurs said that it is their ability to recognize opportunity. So that is the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition have the heaviest weight. So it's number one. So entrepreneurial opportunity recognition or what they call entrepreneurial alertness is the ability of entrepreneurs in Davao to recognize opportunities other missed. Entrepreneurial opportunity recognition is a significant element in opportunity identification with which makes double entrepreneurs more sensitive to business information and more perceptive evaluation, more perceptive evaluation and judgment. So uh, the pairwise comparison have uh, presented a different uh, result in which the number one is the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition ability of the entrepreneur as the heaviest factor that enabled the entrepreneurs here in Davao to withstand and survive the COVID-19 uh, crisis. But looking into the second rank or the, sec the second heaviest weight, it would be the social network, which is also similar to the uh, rank number two in the descriptive uh, result. And the third is the perception on uh, the environment, which was ranked number one in the descriptive, uh, in the descriptive result. So now, in the uh, uh, result, we can now analyze between the two uh, most important factors that was identified in the descriptive and the most important factor that was described in the uh, analytical hierarchy process technique. The one that was identified in the uh, descriptive, uh, descriptive uh, result was the perception on business environmental opportunities. So this was number one in the descriptive and number three in the analytical hierarchy process. So there is now uh, seemingly a uh, difference between the perception on business environmental opportunities against the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition. So this uh, research will now distinguish what is the difference between the perception on business environmental opportunities against the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition. So the entrepreneurs examining the external environment recognize that the interaction of market forces beyond their control 
create opportunities for the firm. So this was uh, the theory that was advanced by the realist. So in other words, the attempt of entrepreneurs to identify these opportunities matches their toes or what they call the threat, opportunity, weakness, and strength or the toes analysis or what they call the SWOT analysis. So the current COVID-19 crisis based on Scampeter and Kisnerian is an exogenous shock to the present economy, creating a greater imperfect market, consequently allowing entrepreneurs to detect an emerging potential to offer new goods and services. COVID-19 crisis is a disruptive force that both create opportunities and destroy the business. So the one that was identified in the uh, descriptive, the one that uh, was identified in the descriptive result of the survey convey that the uh, external environment of the, uh, of the market creates opportunity for the entrepreneurs as recognized by the entrepreneurs in Dabao. So it confirms the uh, realist point of view. So recognizing opportunity is a complex process that allows success or failure and depends on entrepreneurs' perception and abilities. It is an interaction between the characteristic of entrepreneurs and the element emerging in the environment. The entrepreneurs can connect the dots. The skills and ability to identify opportunities are generally described as a tacit knowledge, almost similar to an intuition that it cannot be taught. Yet, researchers confirm that it's fundamental could be taught. Hence, it is possible over time for entrepreneurs to hone their skills and gain more experience with the practice. So the uh, perception on business entrepreneurial opportunities have these distinguished characteristics among entrepreneurs, which means that they're able to examine the external environment, they're able to detect emerging potential, and they possess a tacit knowledge which is described as almost an intuition and able to explore opportunities. So on the other hand, we have the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition. So the uh, entrepreneurial opportunity recognition in other literature is also known as the entrepreneurial alertness. This is the ability of entrepreneurs in Davao to recognize opportunities missed by others. Entrepreneurial opportunity recognition is a significant element in opportunity identification, which makes Davao entrepreneurs more sensitive to business information and more perceptive evaluation and judgment. Moreover, entrepreneurial opportunity recognition arises from technology, market, and environmental changes. Hence, entrepreneurial opportunity recognition is the pursuit of innovation that double entrepreneurs use to understand ideas and create the strong insight in identifying entrepreneurial opportunities. The double entrepreneurs identified entrepreneurial opportunity recognition as the foremost factor that allowed them to be more conscious of innovation. So what are the uh, distinct characteristics of the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition as demonstrated by our respondent? So they say that they recognize opportunity, others have missed. They are more sensitive to business information, which means that they have information asymmetries. Recognize changes in external environment. And this is both exploration and exploitation of opportunities. So therefore, when we say perception on business environmental opportunities, this is more on the external environment, which is confirming the theory of the realist. Whereas the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition confirms both the realist and the uh, constructivism or the uh, constructivist. So the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition is a combination of the realist and the constructivist. 
Now, if we're going to deeply analyze the uh, process of entrepreneurial opportunity recognition, it encompasses the perception on business environmental opportunities. So therefore, the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition is a broader scope compared to the perception on business in environmental opportunities in a manner that the perception on business environmental opportunities is part of the entrepreneurial opportunity recognition. So therefore, in my conclusion, the result of this study confirmed that the evolutionary realism approach has implication. An entrepreneur that identifies more opportunities is the greater probability that some of these opportunities are viable. Since valid opportunities require the amalgamation of existing material and information. Hence, more information enabled entrepreneurs to create association and connections never previously considered. Business survival depends on entrepreneurs' ability to identify opportunity based on evolutionary realism. Entrepreneurial skills, such as entrepreneurial opportunity recognition, is an essential element in the business survival, which several government agencies, university and colleges develop programs and curriculum focused around entrepreneurship education. The findings of this study are significant for managers, educators, and entrepreneurs, identifying entrepreneurial opportunity recognition, social networking, and perception on business environment. So using the uh, analytic hierarchy process, we were able to delve further and uh, analyze and evaluate deeper the, uh, the factors that enable uh, entrepreneurs here in uh, Davao City to uh, withstand and uh, continue to face the challenges brought about by COVID-19. And uh, with that, Terimia uh, Kasi, thank you very much for uh, giving me your precious time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montaño, for that very wonderful talk. No? So it actually ignites or it actually provides a deeper understanding. Why is it some businesses here in the Philippines or some entrepreneurs forced to close their um, businesses while others actually continue and even grow further despite of what's happening now in our country. And it is very insightful and it's very uh, refreshing to understand that these people has different mindset on talking about or recognizing opportunities. So it actually uh, broader than what we expect it to be. No? So uh, as uh, how we uh, perceive um, entrepreneurs to businessmen and how these two actually works together and even more profoundly uh, develop a new characteristics where, you know, resil I mean, cross boundary with resiliency and uh, continuous innovation. As to we are living in a commodity hell where almost everything are available in the market. So it leaves a le little room for the new entrants as entrepreneurs to, you know, emerge or um, um, enter to the market. Thank you very much for that wonderful topic. Um, Dr. Montaño. All right, so at this juncture, so we have prepared some pool for our participants to interact and we do apologize um, on, on behalf of the team who created this, uh, this, this event uh, from the College of Business Administration Upper, uh, Education and also with partnership with our external relations office. Um, we would like to apologize since we cannot accommodate everyone who registered to join in here in our Zoom link, reason why we opted to have a live stream on YouTube in order for those other participants to still listen and still participate in some of our discussion. However, for this pool, we have prepared some of the questions. We just want to know the pulse of our um, attendees here in Zoom. Uh, what would be their thoughts? What would be their observations on the respective locality? This is a combination of Philippine 
um, observant, uh, observation rather, and also an observation in an Indonesia perspective or Indonesia experience. We just want to verify whether we are experiencing the same thing or thus our business economy or business industry are actually moving the same way. Okay, so with that, we prepare two polls. Uh, and here is the first pool for everyone, I mean, for, for the attendees. And also would like to remind that there is no correct and wrong answer since this is just a poll so that we are trying to you know, uncover or we're trying to you know, know or understand by our um, respective attendees. There you go. As you can see in our screen, we have prepared the first poll. The first question is that among many strategies for business survival, what is the most dominant as observed in your locality? The first option is opportunity recognition. Second is perception on environment. And the third one is social network. And the second, second poll is that on the current situation in your area, could be in Philippines and Indonesia, which among of the following you think is the reason why businesses are forced to or temporarily shut down their operation? Is it because of safety purposes? Second, low sales. And the third one is higher cost. Okay, so once you're done, um, choosing based on your experience and in your observation in your respective locality, you may submit it so that we can present it here. Uh, what is the polls or the experiences we had in our um, respective area? And also, while while everyone is attending, I would like also to acknowledge the um, the participants on our YouTube um, channel. So we have um, over 50 um, live streamers and still counting as we go on with our program or our event for today. So thank you very much. And um, again, uh, on behalf of the um, event organizer or the, the in charge of this forum, um, we do apologize since we only have limited slots for, for, Zoom, um, for Zoom account that we are using now. And anyway, um, before we end this, uh, this towards the end of this program, we will be providing links for um, evaluation. Um, we will uh, forward it here in, in the chat box on, 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 on Zoom. And also we will comment it in the comment section on our Facebook, uh, I mean, in our um, YouTube channel so that all participants can answer the evaluation as our basis as well of attendance and as well as for giving out certificates. Okay. So I believe everyone are, uh, are done answering. So if you have noticed, we have um, for, the first, uh, for the first poll, among the many strategies for business survival, what is the most dominant as observed in your locality? So 46% is for opportunity recognition. That is actually shared both from Philippines and Indonesia. So therefore, this is also consistent with the talk of our first speaker that opportunity recognition no matter what technique or style you you recognize opportunity in i mean entrepreneurs dig deeper onto that opportunity to offer not to provide service and to make our life easier and more convenient okay and then for the second one um second pool on the current situation in your area which among the following do you think is the reason why businesses are forced to or temporarily shut down because of the low sales okay so it is also still consistent here in davao because you know um technically because of the government restrictions maybe reason why we have a uh, 50 capacity in some and it depends on the eitf um mandate whether to offer um 10% capacity for all our services, no face-to-face -face services. So um, others actually experiencing lower, uh, low sales reason in order for them to save the company's uh, profit and still can pay off their, uh, their employees so uh, they forced to or temporarily shut down so that they can still recover what they can recover presently. Okay, thank you very much. So I think that is the commonalities we had in Philippines and in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Now moving on for our next topic. So as mentioned by our first speaker, information or data is very important, not just for businesses as what we've learned um, throughout the history, even entrepreneurs, even majority of the, you know, um, 
authors suggest that entrepreneurs decide based on their intuition. Now, as the findings of our first speaker, that um, entrepreneurs now rely on data. Some of the entrepreneurs put more value on data as recognizing opportunity in the market. So talking about data or um, talking about um, you know, data-driven market decisions, our next speaker, okay, let me introduce you our next speaker. He is our research director of Institute of Economy and Enterprise Studies, a technical assistant of Masters in Marketing of the University of Mindanao. And he also has engaged in many speaks. And in fact, his, um, his paper has been featured in many other tabloids here in the Philippines. So help me welcome our second speaker to discuss the data-driven market decision, Dr. John Vian Morsha. Good afternoon, Dr. Morsha. Good afternoon, Dr. Moyon. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And to good afternoon to our participants. I would like to uh, say salamat siyang to our Indonesian uh, students as well as our faculty members from our university, uh, for, from our Indonesian counterpart, uh, the University of Barangkaya, uh, Jakarta Raya. And we are very happy that uh, we have organized this and I was invited to speak uh, to our students uh, with regards to how we can maximize uh, business potential, our firm's potential using data-driven decision-making and using uh, marketing analytics. Um, for some technicalities, may I request that I can be authorized to share? Yep, that would be lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Now, this afternoon, I would be discussing um, quite a little bit of background about what uh, course will, uh, what course uh, that I will be handling in the coming first semester because this will be the first time that the course under the BSBA Marketing Management will be offered in the first semester of this coming school year, and that's uh, marketing analytics. And I would be very happy to say that I have uh, experienced the best of both worlds. Uh, I graduated a marketing management graduate from uh, the University of Mindanao, and I also finished a master's in predictive analytics from Curtin University. So uh, in order for me to pay forward and to give back to my institution, it is but right for me to engage in research and instruction related to data-driven marketing decisions. Okay. Uh, this afternoon is, um, I would be just discussing this quite quickly. So uh, this would be the outline of my discussion. I would just be discussing the new realities of marketing decision making. What's the current uh, scenario of us deciding what to buy, what to consume, and what to um, what to not buy, something like that. And then we, I would be discussing some technical uh, definitions on big data in marketing. What are the three aspects, or the, what are the four Vs of data analytics? And the third one is some marketing models that we can use for decision making. If in case we would be engaged in, you know, business or consumption. So here are some challenges that I have outlined based on some research that I have conducted. So in the past five years, I've been very keen on uh, supervising research, uh, talking about um, consumer behavior, preference modeling, discrete choice models, uh, metric and non-metric conjoint analysis, some forecasting models uh, to predict uh, consumption behavior. And uh, one, thing is very, one thing is for sure, there are common issues despite the different methodologies that are available around which means that uh, our, mark, our marketing decision has been constantly changing based on the constant changes of taste and preferences of our, of our consumers. So for one, we, we are in a hyper-competitive business environment. Right now, there are different uh, scenarios happening around the globe, and these scenarios are actually causing a lot of impacts, maybe positive or negative impacts, on the way how we see things and the way how we buy those things. So we have exploding volume of data. I have realized in, in previous research experience that I have, and, and actually even considering now, that data, who, whoever holds the data holds the power. Because for one, we can gain insights, we can, uh, we can draw a lot of meaningful decision-making coming from the data sets that we hold, okay? 
we're drowning in data what we lack our true insights even though we have a lot of data around us we didn't realize that they're actually meaningful inputs towards our decision making third one is the need for faster decision making since we are in a hyper competitive environment Time is of the essence. We need to decide now because one late decision making can cost you a lot in terms of shares of stocks, in terms of lost profits, in terms of opportunity costs that you could have taken advantage of. So the need for faster decision making is quite emphasized because we are in, in uh, a changing environment where technology as well as information are influential precursory factors. Fourth one is higher standards of accountability. Given that we have a lot of data now, the call for cybersecurity, the call for protecting data privacy, the, the call for confidentiality of information have been emphasized over and over, especially even public platforms. When you when you log in in Facebook, even though you, you actually think that it's for free, but there are a lot of stringent or... Um, there are a lot of policies that could hamper you from freely doing what you just want. There are actually rules and regulations that we need to follow, especially one that emphasizes accountability and protection of personal information of consumers, personal information of those users, and the like. So marketing expenditures have to be justified in the same way as other investments. Promotion is getting more personalized. We are actually using algorithms in order to access the people that we really want to buy our goods and services. That's why these become trade secrets which are put in question because of the sheer lack of accountability that they may insinuate. So here comes the need for better decision making. So better decision making is coupled by technology, experience, intuition, and most importantly, statistical acumen. So I'm, I'm currently practicing as um, a statistician, and it's very overwhelming to know that marketing has a lot of issues that, we, that need data analysis and data analytics. So for one, the need for better decision-making starts or stems from having intuitive decision-making. So uh, a while ago, um, Dean Montano discussed the importance of application of analytical hierarchy process model in order for us to understand what could be the possible attributes that actually affect a specific person to engage in entrepreneurial behavior. But in marketing, it's more than that. You know, it's, it's more than what personality, uh, what personality uh, is suitable for this one. Decision-making for marketing and buying something is very much complicated, not only confined by gut, in, in terms of gut feeling, in terms of instinct, but also practices, experiences, biases, as well as personal preferences. In a world characterized by rapid change, information overload is normal and it's the thing. Greater accountability has been experienced that's why intuition in order intuition in order to for us to understand um, data sets would be a much needed skill so that data analysis produce numbers tables and charts our experience our intuition could help us uh, create meanings out from them and second one is database and model supported decision making our empirical, our, our decision making should be empirical. It has to be grounded not only from the practices and experiences that we have, but also from the science that we use in order for us to understand the totality of the population's behavior. So what is big data? So I have been I have been discussing uh, in, in, in some uh, in some parts of my statement a while ago about the importance of data analytics, data science, what is big data. So big data by definition are massive sets of unstructured or semi-structured data from web traffic, social media, sensors, from your databases, from our systems in the university, from the point of sale system in malls and in department stores and the like. So this big data could be classified as structured or semi-structured. And these data sets 
are actually consuming not only several megabytes of our storage systems, but it, it actually reaches up to petabytes or exabytes of data, which means that it possesses the number one characteristic of uh, big data, which is volume. So volumes too great for typical database management system. So it includes, uh, for example, for me, if in case I'm a member of a specific mall or a shopping store, then if in case someone would ask my past purchases and it would track the past 10 year purchases, remember that I'm not only the customer inside the mall, it could be thousands or it could be hundreds of thousands in the past years. That's actually a very large data set for us to handle using a specific small software that can only analyze hundreds or thousands. This particular big data is analyzed using, using highly sophisticated statistical analysis and software that can actually create patterns out from those millions of data sets. So they include information from multiple internal and external sources. What we have in our databases, if in case you will be owner of firms, what we have there would be validated by mark, external market behavior. They could be validated by trends in social media, and they could be further validated by, 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 by focus group discussions, by interviews among experts, as well as in-depth face-to-face interviews of our clients. So they include transactions, social media, enterprise content, the use of sensors, especially for IoT or Internet of Things driven cities, and mobile devices. So all of the photos, all of the videos that you have, your browsing activity, the number of hours that you spend in, in, in social media, as well as in on screen, they're actually captured by our smartphones in a form of a data set. And those data sets could actually be tapped internally or externally for, for, for marketing companies or for, for uh, search engines or for the software installed in your systems to be um, analyzed at a big data level. So for one, in the last minute, there were like 204 million emails sent. That's big data. There are 61,000 hours of music listened to on Pandora. But right now, uh, I'm not so sure if Pandora is the leading streaming platform. I guess in the Philippines, it's Spotify. And then third one is 20 million photo views. So if in case you are in social media now and you're, you're currently looking for pictures, imagine there are a lot of a lot of human beings currently logged in in Facebook and checking phones. I'm checking their phones and checking the photos if in case. That's why you would, you would be surprised that once you upload something in Facebook like a selfie, it automatically it automatically tags in yourself, your friends or your family members because there the algorithms in Facebook are actually equipped in such a way that it could detect patterns, okay? So there are 100,000 tweets. We have 6 million views and 277,000 Facebook logins, 2 plus million Google searches, which explains why when we type something in the search bar and then there are a lot of suggested phrases or text or uh, search, um, search results. And then we have 3 million uploads in Flickr. But right now, I, I guess Flickr is not that, no. It's not that, um, it, it's, it's not that um, famous the way it was five, 10 years ago. But basically all of this explains the importance of having big data set and the need for us to tap these big data sets for us to create meaningful information. What we need as a, as a 21st century firm or business man or someone who, who will own an enterprise is something uh, something um, forward thinking, which means that we need to anticipate the possible behavior of the people in the next year, in the next five years, by currently looking on the patterns of behavior in the big data that we have. So what are the characteristics of big data? We have four. You know, it, however, uh, I have outlined only here three. We have the volume, the variety, and the velocity. So for one, we have growing quantity of data. So that's very obvious, especially also in terms of marketing. There are a lot of promotional ads targeting us. And these targeted ads or, um, 
advertisements in, in, in some websites or even in social media are actually trained enough, modeled enough to target us having been having matched the specific behavioral behavioral parameters uh, of uh, intended by the advertiser so it could be the way the, the choices of our videos the choices of our pages being like in facebook um the particular websites that we view even uh, while our a Facebook account is still incognito, something like that. So the, the growing quantity of data um, is much uh, complicated by the fact that much of these data sets could be related with one another. So they are not in silos, but they are related. Second one is cleaning speed of data. That's the variety. It's a variety characteristic of big data. So we have smart meters, process monitoring. There are a lot of universities, for one, that have utilized technologies to know real time their water and electricity consumption, and it's being flashed on screen. Um, our smartphones are equipped with sensors. They can detect whether we are moving. That's why it can count the number of steps and the number of kilometers. And where are we going? It's actually detected and plotted in Google Maps. Now, you would be surprised to, to know that your Google Maps have plotted your locations for the past 24 hours. And that's quite, that's kind of scary to begin with, but, but that could be taken advantage by firms and industries. And third one is increase in types of data. So not only that the kind of data which is behavioral or survey-based, which is typically answered uh, using liquor type or liquor scale, but it also includes application data, data coming from our apps or applications. Those data that includes drafts or actual text messages sent, um, the kind of the kind of uh, emojis or emoticons that you attach in a text message or in a reply in Facebook. Uh, you might be surprised when you when you chat something that's actually. Uh, that's actually not in conformity with Facebook guidelines. It's automatically banned after you send it. So it's it's not really that sent, but it's it's automatic automatically blocked by the algorithm because we have specific models in place to identify these behavior, our behavior in the, by individuality or according to our individuality and according to what the the, the market uh, is or what what kind of market we are. So we have volume, so we have petabytes or exabytes of data. The volume is too great for typical database management systems. Our DBMS would explode by the fact, or it would actually explode if in case it would house millions or billions or trillions of uh, megabytes of data. So we need to have a larger space to accommodate this data because once you run an algorithm for that, like a classification algorithm, or um, you you would run um, you would run something that would actually uh, do extrapolation of missing data. Then our computers would take a huge amount of effort to create meaningful patterns for us to interpret because our normal database management system couldn't handle as much. In terms of velocity, that means massive amount of streaming data. So you don't know that our cars now have sensors. It would give you uh, warning signals if in case um, if in case you're out of gas or if in case something has uh, punctured you, the, the wheels of your car or if in case you want to to uh, integrate or harmonize your Bluetooth and your and your Wi-Fi uh, and your Wi-Fi into your computer into your in the, into the computer system of your car. That's actually uh, a manifestation of velocity because right now we need to be very fast and quick in terms of decision making. So, for example, if in case you are in a car and you're holding a phone and it's not integrated, you could land in an accident. If in case you would answer by picking up the phone, but but cars right now are actually improved in such a way that it harmonizes the system of your car and the system of your phone and the system of your gadgets so that you can experience what you want to do inside the car without being jeopardized. Be just because uh, our decision making is faster and integrated, having different systems integrated in one piece. 
So in terms of velocity, there's analysis of streaming data. For example, if in case you want to, to view something in YouTube and you want to determine which particular scene in that YouTube video uh, has gained a lot of attention from followers, it could, be, it could be like a specific line blurted by a politician, then you can see the patterns of the streaming in which uh, that one is the peak and the other one is the decline or the, the steepest part of the decline. So the velocity would tell us also that um, big data could actually command attention. It, also, it could also create um, meaningful engagements, which could actually be, um, which could actually be uh, taken uh, advantage of in terms of decision making. Velocity also pertains to how fast we decide based on the ever rapid changing uh, market environment. The third one is variety. So in terms, of, in terms of marketing analytics, variety actually discusses about different forms of data set. That could include uh, posts in Facebook. It could actually be tweets in Twitter. It could actually be the number of likes, shares, the number of care, in emojis or emoticons, the number of hearts being given, uh, the, the number of chats that are currently streaming at this very second. So these are different types of data. It could be emoticons, it could be, it could be words, it could be phrases, or it could be images. And all of them are actually in one uh, massive network, which is Facebook or Twitter. So for example, we have here by 2014, it's anticipated there will be 420 million wearable wireless health monitors. The one that we're wearing to monitor our, uh, our blood pressure, uh, the one that we're wearing in order to monitor our steps, if in case we have met the 10,000 steps requirement to maintain a good life or to have a, a, a healthy body, then that's one of them. And then we have massive sets of unstructured or semi-structured data from the web traffic, not just the web, it's also found from the apps of your phones, from the sensors, even from your, from your watch, and even from uh, your computers. Okay, so if in case they're integrated, then they, the data could actually just, just be um, easy to, to be captured. Uh, fourth one is veracity of the data. So however, despite the fact that we have billions or even trillions of data sets around us, the data sets are, uh, are there, uh, not, not just, um, they're there, but they are not um, analyzed or taken advantage. They are not even used for decision making. And if there are data sets, some of them are incomplete, some of them are actually fake or manufactured, which actually affects our decision making. So the fourth component or characteristic, which is veracity, or tells us about the uncertain the uncertainty of the data set that we have. In fact, poor data quality costs the United States economy around $3.1 trillion a year, added by the fact or is ameliorated by fake news, fake data sets, and data sets that are not actually checked according to quality standards. So one in three business leaders don't trust the information they use to make decisions. Survey data that we use are actually even questionable because there could be some ethical considerations when we gather those data or that the people that we serve as unit of analysis could not actually, could not actually provide us the correct data set based on the perception because they might be forced, they might be bored, or they might not be interested to answer our survey data. That's why the data sets that we have could not, could not be a 100% guarantee that it could provide us the meaningful information that we expect. So in marketing, uh, we, we have uh, married the marketing management profession and the big data and data science into one single course, which is marketing analytics. Marketing analytics is cognizant to what's happening in the external, uh, external marketing environment. The marketing environment gives us hassle or the political, economic, sociocultural, technological, environmental, and laws and legislations as external forces. The marketing analytics tries to understand the internal environment, uh, being aware of what are the expected configurations of the marketing environment and it actually passes it actually is a funnel type system in which we get meaningful 
decision making from the information that we gather from our data. So the data is being provided by the marketing environment. It could actually be coming from our database management. It could actually be coming from our external stakeholders or our clients. And then we do selection, sorting, summarizing, and report generation of those data so that we can create meaningful information. The meaningful information that we have is actually corroborated by our experience, intuition, and um statistical models or our our skills in statistics now in order for those information to become insightful we need to apply mental models and decision models mental models which are actually an outcome of our intuition and experience and decision models that are actually an outcome of research and empirical analysis those insights are now then subjected to judgment under uncertainty, which means that we need we still need to verify those insights by creating specific models. We need to train, cross-validate, and test before we can actually predict something. And then we communicate these insights to the responsible decision makers of the workplace and then allow them to introspect or to brainstorm what could be the possible strategies they would be doing under these normal circumstances or under these circumstances which are actually different because we are in a pandemic. Decisions would, would be coming from the insights and those decisions are as good as decisions being implemented. Now, implementation of decisions would actually mean financial, human resource or HR, and other organizational resources, which are actually being affected by the kind of data and marketing environment that we have. So a model, according to some experts, are stylized representations of realities. According to Turban in 1994, Models are reconstruction of social realities, which means that we need to have theory being, uh, uh, being consistent with actual practice or behavior of people. The theory is just something that we consider paradigm. The model is the statistical representation of that based on the data in the ground. So models indicate which factors should be considered and which factors can be ignored. For example, if in case you would be doing something like modeling or predicting sales of, say, Spotify, so what could be the possible uh, parameters that we need to factor in those model, let's say an ordinary least squares regression model, so that we can determine the optimum sales for this month having those parameters. By focusing on these relevant factors, and their interrelationships, then we can actually simplify the complexity of the reality that we are trying to attain. And models are useful because they facilitate top-down processing, which means that our decision-making would be coming from the grassroots level or from the data set level. And then our intuition could, be, could lead us to change the grassroots level by deciding or creating strategies intended for our market base. So there are issues in using models. If in case you want to utilize models for, 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 for your decision making, uh, we need to assemble not only one, not only two, three, four, but a wide range or arsenal of models for a specific domain of interest, which means that you need to have a wide range of knowledge about specific statistical, algorithmic, and data analytic models. It's not just enough that we know specific statistical tests like um, correlation, reg uh, simple linear regression. It's not just enough. Right now, it's, it's more than that. It's more than, it's more than simple, multiple, binary logistic or multinomial logistic regression. You need this to understand the nature of the data set that you have so that you can know what algorithm to apply and the decision making could be much efficient. Second one is retrieving relevant mental models in a given situation. You, you also need the inputs of specific experts of the field to validate those models. You need to um, ensure also the input of uh, the top management who knows specific circumstances about the event that you are modeling in the past. And third one is being aware of the limitations of mental models. Our mental models are only representation of experiences, intuition, and gut feeling of 
our participants or those decision makers. We couldn't rely 100% on those mental models. That's why in data science, you have to be complementary. You have to complement your, your intuition with empirical basis. Because there is no model that's true, but some models are useful. So we have four types of models we have here. So we have verbal model, like sales are a function of advertising. It's just a statement, but it's actually saying something empirical and testable. And then if it is you're trying to convert that into a box and arrow or a paradigm or a diagrammatic representation, advertising as a box, as a variable points on sales. It's another variable, which means that an advertising could lead to an increase or decrease of sales, but theoretically, it's, it should increase your sales. It could be graphical. You could use the XY axis or the Cartesian coordinate system to plot the data set of advertising expenditures and sales. Or you can represent such model into an equation or mathematical form, like sales is equal to A constant plus BA or the beta of advertising plus ever term. So this is an example of uh, a quadratics and it's, it, it's, it, 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 it's an example of a regression equation. So sales or Y hat equals A or the constant plus the beta of advertising, which is the coefficient of your regressor plus the error term or the stochastic error. So which, whichever representation uh, you want, these are models that we are um, we that we need to know. You no, know, it could be verbal, it could be, it could be box and arrow, it could be graphical, or it could be mathematical. Now here's um here is a paradigm that discusses the response models in a decision loop. This is a very generic decision loop in marketing, and it could actually be um, reinforced by marketing data. So uh, we have here um, a complement of marketing actions or inputs like product design, price advertising, selling efforts, and et cetera, which could actually become the basis for competitive actions or the kind of response model considering those factors, which, which are also reinforced by environmental conditions. So for example, uh, our response model to increase sales is through investments in advertising, then you need also to consider what are the products or the product bundles available, who are your competition, what are the prevailing prices, the selling efforts of your people, which have to be matched with the conditions of your external forces of the environment. What kind of, what, what kind of political environment do you have? Is there is there a political turmoil in your, in your area? Because this can actually affect the, compet the competitive actions that you have when you factored in a response model in developing a, a response model to predict uh, sales performance of your company. So internal environment and external environment have to be in complement with, with each other. Because once you do your response model, then you can create observations or output. You can model references, you can model sales, and you can model or determine the level of awareness of the people around. And these have to be evaluated based on your objectives, based on the very mission, vision, and goals of your company. If in case there are inconsistencies, then there could be a need for you to go back to your inputs or your controllable marketing actions. Uh, you, you need to adapt to specific changes based on the empirical data that you have, and then you try modeling again, okay? So this is iterative in nature, which means that uh, having a specific model in place for your company, it has to be iterative, it has to change based on changing effects of regressors or variables under your marketing actions and under your environmental conditions. So for example, I, I have here a simple linear response model or a simple linear regression plotting your advertising expenses vis-a-vis -vis your sales. In the x-axis, you have advertising spending, which means that you need to spend in order for you to create, I'm sorry, sales, in which is in the y-axis. Now, you can see here um, that there is an increasing trend 
which means that there could be a positive relationship between advertising spending and sales. How did I confirm that? Because I plotted in the kind of the kind of um, relationship that we have. No? So this is the actual and predicted sales as a function of advertising or spending. So uh, this is the graphical output, and this is the simple linear response model. This is the summary output of the regression statistics. We can see here uh, highlighted parts, the R-square and the adjusted R-square. As you can see here, um, it seems to be that advertising has a positive influence on sales. Uh, and advertising explains like an 88% to 90% of the variation of actual sales holding other variables constant, which means that ad actual advertising spending could actually be influential by around 88 to 90% on sales, while the remaining 10 to 12% is explained by other variables that we haven't included in the study. So this is a typical statistical output, which is actually um, complementary with this graphical output. And uh, this one is actually built in four easy steps. We need to specify the model by determining the variables that we have and their relationships of these variables, this, the, the, the dynamics of these variables and the interaction of these variables. Second one is to calibrate the model by doing some experiments, doing some surveys, doing some managerial judgments. And third one is checking the fit and the appropriateness of this model by looking at the R-square. Looking at the R-square, which it seems to be that we have captured like a significant portion of the variation, uh, noting that there is 88 to 90% of the variance of sales from advertising alone. So we need to check face validity, the global fit or the R-square, and the variable significance. If in case you can check on your statistics, uh, that's where you will identify which among these, val these variables have P values less than 0 0.05. That's it. And if in case we have applied the optimum model, then we, up, we, have, we determine the, the, the correct or the optimum model, then we apply it uh, in future uh, decision making, we, we, we need to check whether or not the model is easy to use or useful or realistic when it comes to decision making. Because at the end of the day, um, what we need in business is profit. And profit is basically modeled as revenues less the cost. Now, revenues have to be broken into several components. It should be sales volume times the price. Now, knowing the price, should be competitive and it should be realistic and it should be according to what has been approved by the government and what are the prevailing prices in the environment. You have to factor this in your model and the sales volume that you have should be a portion of your market share or where you stand in the business ecosystem. The cost is not something that we need to, that we need to um, also um, Compromise. We need to be very realistic in our cost. Okay. Finally, we, we we have here the process. No, these are these are simple processes that we need to remember when we decide what specific decision making are we going to to derive. I'm going to give um you a several. I'm going to provide a copy of this so that you can capture uh, capture the remaining uh, specific parts of this um process uh, model for marketing analytics. And uh, key takeaways uh, for this lecture is that in, um, in marketing, the use of big data in marketing has a specific um, value. For one, it makes us to uh, have better informed decisions. We can create strategies and recommendations. Second one is we discover hidden insights like anomalies, patterns, and trends. And finally is we automate business processes by knowing complex events, translations, as well as um, detecting specific uh, hiccups uh, in the future, having this model around. So I guess that ends my lecture. Dagang salamat, uh, University of Mindanao participants, and terima kasih to our Indonesian students and faculty members and experts from UBJ. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Morsha, for that very wonderful and insightful information about the um, you know data-driven marketing decision. Indeed.
No, data is not just there for us to, you know, to view or to uh, to to look for, but also a usage of data. This variety, the voracious data available in uh, in our fingertips, is very helpful for once to improve our all um, business strategy. Now, as this juncture, as what we did on the first speaker, we also prepared some of the questions related to the topic discussed by Dr. Morsha a while ago. So we prepared two questions to be answered by our participants here in the Zoom um, webinar. So uh, here is the question. So please choose the correct answer of these two questions prepared for you. So first, an area of model building where you determine the significance of the included variable. So we have choices here, specification, calibration, validation, and application. And the second one is that what is the presence of massive sets of unstructured, semi-structured data from web traffic, social media, sensors, and so on indicates big data. So is it volume, veracity, variety, or velocity? So there. And also would like to remind everyone towards uh, the, next, the next portion of this um, program or the next uh, part of the program would be our discussion for open discussion for both our guest discussant from the University of Bayangkara, Indonesia, and also from the University of Mindanao, our, our two uh, speakers who spoke a while ago with their respective topic. So we have questions uh, prepared and also for our attendees, they prepared question actually in our chat room. And also for uh, participants in our YouTube, you may comment your questions in the comment section in YouTube, and then uh, we will try to accommodate as much as we can if the time still permits us to have your answer. I mean, to have to, to answer your questions. So there. So for the first question, the correct answer is validation. No, and uh, model building where you determine the significance of the included data. We need to validate them in order for us to really make sure that they are significant variable to be considered in our uh, in our problem. And for the second, the presence of massive sets of unstructured, semi-structured data from the web, no, especially from social media, sensors, and so on, indicates big, big data variety. So the correct answer here is variety. So at least we are now informed. So therefore, there is no wrong and right here. So this is just actually an information of everyone for us to, uh, to really dig deeper on what would be the, you know, the correct approach used in the data. So, so much for that. Let's proceed to the next part of the program. So we have an open discussion to be handled or to be answered by our guest discussant and also from our two speakers. So before that, let me introduce our guest discussant from the um, from University of from UBJ. First one, we have from the Engineering Faculty of Bayangkara Jakarta Raya University. We have Engineer Vifya S.T. Wiryawanti. She finishes Master's in Management um, in, in Indonesia. Also, for the second guest discussion, also from the Faculty of Engineering of the same university in Indonesia, Engineer Ratna Suminar. She oh. also finished her master's in management. Okay, welcome, um, Engineer Vifya and Engineer Ratka. Welcome here. And also, please oh, help thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> also, we would like to welcome again our two speakers, uh, Dr. Montano and Dr. Uh, Morsha, to join us here. So, whatever the questions we have from our representative or from our um, attendees or our audience and also uh, the question garnered no, for the intention of this um, event. So may we include Dr. Morsha, there you go, and also uh, Dr. Montano. Okay, there you go. Welcome everyone. Okay. So also now for the first question, this is actually intended for Engineer Vifya. So this is for the um, Indonesian's perspective or uh, based on your experience and expertise, engineer. So how do small businesses in Indonesia 
thrive in this time of pandemic, talking about the innovation marketing strategy employed by small and medium enterprises, and even for big corporations. Would you like to share, um, Dr. Okay. Engineer Vipia? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank Mark. you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Magandang hapon. <laughs> Magandang hapon. Hi. <laughs> Okay, thank you, our honorable lecturer Barajaya, for being here. Bapak Dr. Bambang Karsana MHM, our honorable vice president, Dr. Tessy Mirawes, the our dean, Dr. Vincent Salvador Montano, and then the director of for Institute Economy and Studies, Studies, Dr. John Vianney. I'm sorry, I have to complete. Okay, okay our dear colleague from uh, College of Business Administration Education. Uh, Dr. Christian Paul Moyan, and then also my dear Dean of Engineer Faculty, Bapak uh, Ibnu here, and Bapak Suhardi as Chief of BKS EO Ubarajaya, and Ibu Ratna, my dear colleague here. Uh, it is an honor to have a discussion with you experts <laughs> in this valuable uh, event for sharing our knowledge in the horizon for our countries and the world. The background is since the opening of relations in about 1949, yeah, until now, bilateral relations actually between Indonesia and the Philippines have been going well and stable. There are already some bilateral consultation forums have already existed, namely the Joint Commission for Bilateral Cooperation, JCPC, Border Committee Chairman's Conference, Philindo Joint Committee Meeting, etc., etc. Yeah. Uh, these forums need to be optimized to discuss and identify together, right? But yet we are going to talk about MSME. Okay. Uh, now we are going to see from the Indonesian side. Okay. Now, uh, firstly, we have to recognize that small and medium enterprises in Indonesia is under the shelter of the Ministry of Cooperatives and Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. Micro, small and medium enterprises, commonly called here in Indonesia, UMKM, or Usaha Mikro, Kecil and Menengah, dan Menengah, refer to the business that can stand alone, which refers to the type of small-scale business. There are several perspectives related to the business of definitions of MSMEs, that's it. Uh, from the World Bank, uh, defines an SMEs using three criteria from the number of employees, the annual balance sheet in United States dollar, or is it called asset, and turnover in United States dollars. Yeah? MSME, according to the perspective of the World Bank, are divided into three. First, micro enterprises with the criteria of the number of employees working less than 10 people, annual income, and exceeding $100,000, total assets owned at more than $100,000. And small enterprise with the criteria, the number of employees, more than 10 people, and less than 50 people, or something like that. And medium enterprises, uh, the employees who work more than 50 people and less than 300 people. Well, more than that uh, are called big corporations. According to the Ministry of Cooperation and Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises, Indonesia already has a legal basis related to, inter uh, to entrepreneurship, including law, government rules, and minister rules. Dear fellows, survival strategies in overcoming economic shocks and pressures can be carried out with various strategies. This is a pandemic, yes, but we have to survive, right? So that's why many survival strategies can be classified, can be done by uh, those who are belong to the MSME and the big corporation. Survival strategies, if it can be classified into three categories here, that is active strategy, yeah, uh, passive strategy, and network strategy. Active strategy is the active strategy that is survival strategy can be carried out by utilizing all the potential that is owned. For the example, yeah, a family, a family will do their activities, extending working hours and doing anything to increase their income. 
ya. An active strategy usually carried out by low income families by optimizing all the family's potential. The other strategies that an is usually carry out is diversifying their income or seeking additional income by doing side jobs. <coughs> Sorry. Why? Income diversification is carried out by an SME so that economic actors can get out of poverty. They are very small or micro, micro, sorry, uh, enterprises. So this is the active strategies used by households to overcome economic difficulties. Well, for passive strategy, it's a survival strategy that is done by minimizing family expenses. They save their money to gain more time for so they are financially okay. The passive strategy is a strategy, yeah, for the example, by reducing family expenses. For example, cost for clothing. Usually they buy 100, now they only buy the lower cost by food, education, etc. In this pandemic, many Many, sorry, I'm sorry, many children are unable uh, to continue their education. So, because that, why? Uh, because they do the passive strategy. The passive, sorry, the passive strategy in MSME usually carried out to get used living frugally. Yeah, they do a frugal lifestyle so that their income can meet the basic needs of their families. Well, in network strategy, is a strategy is carried out by utilizing social network. So by using network, they can be formally and socially and institutionally can be uh, related with their um, uh, environments. It occurs due to social interaction in society. Social networks can help low-income families urgently need money. They can use the network. In MSME strategies to survive in this pandemic area, sorry, in Indonesia, usually uh, done like this. The COVID-19 pandemic has a direct impact on MSME actors. These impacts include a decrease in turnover, a decrease in the number of consumers, and limited space for business actors to sell their products offline. The MSME actors in several regions prefer to close their business because of the PSBB policy. Yeah. As Dr. Mentenu said, being an entrepreneur must have the ability to recognize and create business opportunities. An entrepreneur must think positively and creatively Positive and creative thinking are characteristic that must be owned by a interpreter. All right, doctor? <laughs> now, here, in, uh, in M -M, uh, sorry, M MSMEs, some entrepreneurs claim to have various efforts. Their efforts are such as, for the example, uh, they are in e-commerce to strengthen the selling power of MSME players who were experiencing a decline during the pandemic. A strategy was needed related to the use of technology through online media. Okay, now digital marketing. There are several strategies to survive the MSME during the COVID-19. First, well, yes, well, using digital marketing by developing promotional media through social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and then improving the quality of human resources through technology learning, and then having more creative uh, innovation so that consumer will be interested in the product. For the example, if we use Rabi, it's a kind of food, traditional food. They put it with cheese or this mask with beads, mask connector. It is a innovation. And then ensuring security and improving services, sorry, services to consumer to make a shorter time service, bonus, promo, etc. While the government policy in providing assistance programs to MSME 
Uh, we are going to talk about it later. I'm going to explain later. Okay. Now, the product quality improvement strategy during the COVID-19 pandemic and SME players must adjust the sales of their products and services. It is necessary to improve the quality of products and services appropriate to attract customers' attention. attention sorry. Now, after that is marketing strategy. In the normal area, and SME players can market their products through technology where there, these products are marketed online through social media, such as once again, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, yeah. And then apart from social media, and SME players market their products through e-commerce platforms, such as Lazada, Shopee, Tokopedia, and others. The transition of marketing technique to digital business, uh, business can make MSME players more resilient during this COVID-19 pandemic. Based on information from Coordinating Minister for Economic Affairs, until June uh, 2020, around 301, uh, 115 MSME players were switching their business online through digital print. Uh, platforms. Due to status data below, at the end of this November 2020, there were 4 million MSME players who used the digital platform. The use of digital platforms can make business managed by MSME players much more developed than usual. The use of online product marketing technology can increase MSME sales to minimize the impact of PSBB. PSBB or PSBB is the large scale social restriction. Enough. Yeah, okay. Then another, there is promotion strategy, of course, where they have to promote it, for the example, and there is a service strategy, and then there is also pricing strategy. Well, that's all. And well, for the government incentive, of course, Indonesian, uh, Indonesian government provides an interest subsidy for 35 million, uh, 35 trillion rupiah. And for many things, the final UMKM DTP income tax incentive is more than trillion, it's all about 300 trillion for an SMT. Well, so uh, I think the big corporation also use the same strategies sort of right there. Oh, yeah. So, yes, okay. <laughs> the pandemic okay. has changed already. I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. All right. Thank you very much for that, Engineer Viv. Yeah, it is very um, insightful. No, it's very also, um, at least um, us here in the Philippines can also reflect with how the Indonesian strategies actually yeah. occurs or, you know, creates here during this pandemic. So now, um, moving forward, we have one question also from Engineer Ratna. So um, very briefly, uh, Engineer Ratna, how data is made available within our fingers to have made small businesses see an opportunity for expansion. So what is your take about this uh, briefly? Yes, Engineer Ratna, go ahead, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dautal. Good afternoon, all participants of this forum, especially uh, our Honorable Rector of UPD and President Director of UM. And thank you, Mr. Dr. Mantanio and Dr. Ms. Do Mr. Dr. Murcia for very interesting uh, presentation. It provides us a new insight. It's honored to be guest discussion in this event. Uh, my summary, according to this presentation, in this area, the, uh, the pandemic, even the, the new normal, also including the uh, industrial revolution 4.0, almost the old firm had to survive. Uh, it means uh, environment factor caused uh, the emperor, uh, entrepreneur to survive. No exception. A uh, small entrepreneur or corporate entertainment uh, entrepreneur, they had to adjust the, uh, their business rapidly. Uh, then, how can they survive? I think uh, there are three components used uh, by the company. The first, data of customer. Moreover, the, fir the firm used information technology to collect and manage various data also from uh, various source in, uh, into data mining. 
Uh, second is uh, the actor. Uh, who is the actor? The actor is individual or group in the firm or in, uh, in the business. Uh, in this case, is marketing division. The third, uh, as well as we know in marketing theory, there is a niche market. Uh, how to connect it to the, this component? Marketing division uh, use data mining into business knowledge uh, to explore uh, what the customer need now, how to build a relationship with the customer without meet face to face uh, like a before this pandemic, uh, or they want to know about the customer behavior change in Indonesia or com uh, compare in Philippines. After that, uh, they may they have making decision to choose the strategy that useful uh, for the business. So, in the optimistic uh, view that uh, data mining can be the, an opportunity for company to find a niche market during the pandemic. I think the pandemic is also niche market. Uh, in Indonesia, the impact caused by the pandemic, there is the phenomenon uh, that the, the entrepreneurs are growing by utilizing social media. According to my, uh, uh, according my, uh, my small observation to my friend, uh, experience during the pandemic, uh, my friend suddenly become culinary entrepreneur. Before he only uh, work, uh, go to the home and work uh, office and do the work, and then now they using their time when we have her, uh, work from home to learn how to bake pastry. Uh, she learned uh, from YouTube. She is mostly using source made, uh, uh, such as uh, Instagram and Facebook, to promote the product. Uh, what she do the next? My friend said that now nah, I still have to manage my customer, so my customer don't get bored, uh, and I can keep continue my business. She had the data, then she maintains the data to improve her business and found the new product or new market. So all she do within his finger, I think. They see the, the YouTube, they uh, promote the product with the one uh, handphone. Uh, <laughs> uh, we call it handphone, cell phone. Uh, my conclusion for discussion, uh, the benefit of the data driven uh, to sustain Business are a key to supporting various organization discuss uh, decisions, uh, especially for marketing division according to this to topic. Data mining can provide the firm's knowledge, explore and develop the new product and new market, and then uh, to create the new method of marketing and gain competitive advantage. But it's all depend on the entrepreneur intention and mindset. Are they know if this is an opportunity? I think that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Engineer Ratnov, for that wonderful um, explanation on how you know we can use advantage of this data. So now we have question here from Dr. Montano coming from Patama Shanipar and from um, Lisa Adhani from the Indonesia. So she was asking, uh, the first question would be, um, can you please elaborate briefly what do you mean by social network in the second posi position as significant variable as the findings of uh, your presented survey, uh, Dr. Montano? And the second one is that um, analytical hierarchy process is a method for solving complex situation that is not structured into several components in hierarchical arrangements. So by giving subjective values about the relative importance of each variable, which is the question of how to determine which variable has the highest priority in order to um, influence result in that situation. So his question is, is there any software that could help to solve the uh, limitation of the AHP. Go ahead, Doc. I, uh, thank you for uh, 
asking the uh, two question. The uh, the uh, first question uh, in which uh, we have uh, the social network. So it based on your uh, acquaintances, based on your uh, friends, some of your peers. If you are a member of a uh, business organization or a member of a business association, like a uh, chamber of commerce, so it includes a uh, part of your social network. So based on your uh, social network, you'll be able to uh, extract information. And then uh, from based on those information, entrepreneurs process this and uh, formulate if there would be certain opportunities that would be uh, that they would be able to take advantage and act on these opportunities. On the uh, second question, there are um, uh, software that are available in the uh, internet and there are a certain template in which uh, available also for free in the internet in which you're able to uh, do a uh, crude a crude computation of the analytic hierarchy process. Okay, so thank you very much. The analytic hierarchy process, uh, a calculator or uh, uh, factors. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Montaña, for that answer. Now, um, I would like to apologize to everyone as much as we've loved to, you know, accommodate all the questions being sent to us. Um, we have due to the limited time. So we are down to our last question. So Dr. Morsha, this is more of um, motivation or advice um, as a millennial, not as a one who belongs to millennial bracket. So I believe this is very suited for Dr. Morsha. So this is a question from one of our students uh, from UM Panabo College and also related question from um, related question from one of the uh, question from the University of uh, Indonesia. Um, question is that um, for despite of the pandemic we are facing right now, what is the most motivation or what can you advise as well to the students um, to pursue the, the career or the track that they are choosing, which is business management or any business allied courses, and also uh, to encourage them to become an entrepreneur rather than a mere employee or just uh, you know an employee of a certain businessman. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Dr. Moyan. Although I have answered uh, the two questions uh, by typing in my answer here, but uh, might as well I would elaborate my my response to them. No? So. For the anonymous attendee from UM Panabo College, uh, I think he or she has a difficulty of really deciding whether or not he or she will pursue a business program considering that it's pandemic. And he might or he, she might be um, hesitant on the future that might hold because businesses might not be that stable now, something like that. So uh, it's one way of affirming his or her choice about uh, business administration. Well, for one, whatever circumstances that we have, uh, the very intention of having a business program is to teach you to become independent. It would, it would teach you to become not only uh, an employee or a specific a practitioner in the field that you're selecting, but also an enterprise holder. You could, be, you could create your own business. You could, create your, your, you could create your own enterprise and hire those people in need of jobs. You know? Uh, for one, I can relate with, with, with your dilemma because I too is supposed to not enroll in a business program. I, I, I am actually destined supposedly to select a microbiology program, but fate is very cruel, it seems, because I was not able to make it to the deadline and I was forced to, or literally I was forced to take a business program because it's one of the most promising careers according to my mom. And it, it proved to be a bad decision at first, but later on I, I actually learned to love it because when I was in my second year, I decided to take marketing because uh, it's one of the most promising careers there is. And I love to talk. You no, know, I can I, I can really sell something when I talk. You know? So that that I, I I really took advantage of my skills and uh, took the business program special specializing in marketing to learn more how can I perfect that skill. So if in case uh, you're in we're in a pandemic and you're uncertain, uh, I want you to to take a pause and then try to. To, to imagine the reason why you selected business administration in the first place and then select what specialty that you have, 
identify your skills and the skills that you might want to improve. Because in the first place, the pandemic is, you know, it's a two, it's a two side, it's a two phase sword. It can be a curse, it can be a blessing. It's a curse because it has closed a lot of industries and businesses, but it's also a wake up call for you. You, you might want to take the pandemic as an inspiration to do what you love and capitalize on it. And then you might want to be, you might want to take advantage of the skills that you have, apply it with the current business program that you have, and then create a startup because anyone starts from somewhere. It could be a business graduate like you, it could be a business student like you, or it could be a non-business student like them. So whatever the degree is, if in case you want to succeed in life, a business administration a degree could actually help you, but it's you who will decide for it. Now, for the second question, how to change the general millennial's way of thinking to become an entrepreneur instead of an employee and create jobs. Now, I have also encoded my, my, my answer here, but it's actually just very brief. In my own opinion, the general thinking, the general millennial thinking of being employed is a complicated outcome of several factors. It's uh, an outcome of culture social expectations. We need to be employed so that we can get a job and pay for the bills, that's social expectation. Of course, family upbringing. So your mom might want you to become an engineer or a manager of a bank, or they might want you to become an accountant. So we could not contest the will of our parents when we're still young. Added by values and industry expectations. So our values could actually be... Um, lead us to become introvert or extrovert, or it could be more of, a, of an exploratory person or inquisitive person, plus what happens to our industries now. So depending on, uh, on the industry that you want to work with, of course, those are factors that we need to consider uh, when, when we try to become, uh, when we try to engage in employment or creating businesses. So it's very, very complicated. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Marsha, for the wisdom. No, um, Employment to... has been seen as an easy way for our students to earn money and gain experience. And that's true, particularly in the Commission of Higher Education, to really create people who will create jobs. Very hard for us to do that. That's why it starts by having professors inspiring those students. It starts by... Uh, creating meaningful programs and activities and assessments that would actually inspire them to create jobs rather than be a job seeker. It also is reinforced by having a more accepting and a more amiable culture for business owners or startups. No, we don't want to discriminate them by starting businesses. We need to reinforce a culture of acceptance of them being risk takers. And it starts... Also, you making your own decision whether you're going to engage in starting to produce more enter, uh, entrepreneurs and having people work with these entrepreneurs. It has to be a complementary balance of the, of the number of people working in both sides. So I guess that's my take, Dr. Moyon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Morsha, for that wonderful um, wisdom and motivation to young millennials or to millennials or to everyone as a whole, no? Because being an entrepreneur is not about the age range. It's about the willingness and the ability and the decisions you made for yourself. All right. So thank you very much for all our guests discussed and also for our resource speaker for this event for today. So before we formally end the, uh, the program, let me award the certificates of appreciation to all of our guest discussant and for our resource speaker for sharing his time and wisdom as the resource speaker during the University of Mindanao and Universitas Bayangkara Jakarta Raya International Collaborative Lecture Series with the theme Utilizing Data-Driven Decisions via Zoom webinar. Given this 29th of June, 2021, signed by Dr. Guillermo P. Torres, Jr., the president of the University of Mindanao, and Dr. Bangbang Bang, um, Carsonio 
Rector Universitas Bayangkara, Jakarta Raya. Award this to um, Dr. Vicente Salvador Montano. Thank you very much, Dean. And also the same citation will be awarded to Dr. John Vian Morsha. Thank you very much, Dr. Morsha. And also the same, uh, the same citation is to, to be awarded to Engineer Ratna Suminar S. Um, thank you very much, Engineer. And also the same cit um, citation is awarded to Engineer Vidya S.P. Wariawanti, um, SPD. Thank you very much, Engineer. And now to formally close our event, um, please help me welcome to do a closing remark. It is our honor to have um, the Vice Dean for Academic Affairs, Faculty of Engineering in Bayangkara, Jakarta Raya University, Dr. Engineer Ibnu S. Joyo Semita. Good afternoon, Doc. Good afternoon. Can you hear my voice? Yes, we can yes, hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your participation in this collaborative lecture series. First of all, uh, let me introduce myself. I am Ibn Susanto Josmito, Vice Dean of Engineering Faculty, University of Bayangkara, Jakarta Raya. I would like to extend best regard from my dean that also apologize because she can join in this time however she already prepares the closing speech so on behalf of my dean i would like to uh, read her closing speech as follow good afternoon everyone honorable from university of mindanao vice president brands operation dr tesi mirales Dean the College Business Administration Education, Dr. Vincente Salvador Montano, Director for Institute Economy and Enterprise Studies, Dr. John Vianney Murcia, also honorable from University of Bayangkara, Jakarta Raya, Mrs. Ratna Suminar and Viptia, Lecturer of Engineering Faculty, and Dr. Christian Paul Moyon as host of this program, also for the committee and all of audience who has joined in to this event. We have reached the end of the lecture series. My closing remarks as follows. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic is being felt in business and economy worldwide. In very short time, marketing patterns has changed, especially when social distan distancing is enforced. Business people optimize online marketing and digital branding to communicate, to communicate with their customers. The impact of COVID-19 outbreaks has hit many business sectors. Some businesses that have potential to experience decline in sales, for example, are workshops, restaurants, salons, spas, properties, mice, tour and travel, hotels, transportation, flight, mall, fashion, and several other business sectors. There are also several, several business sectors that have potential to be stable, that keep increasing, such as health products that are needed during the pandemic, e-commerce, mini market, basic food stores, pharmacies, herbal shops, internet providers, video conference services, application for learning from home, Etc. For the education business, it now has med learning services from home. The students are given access to study from home through application that make it easier for students to learn. Likewise, for business training, now we can immediately adapt by creating training or webinars that can be accessed via video conference application. So for a hotel, no, also change hotel room facilities into resting place for medical personnel and so on. Brand strategy and marketing products in midst of COVID-19, for example, electronic product, they can open shopping service from home. Likewise, retail business can open message delivery services to be optimized. 
And in fact, there are also cosmetic companies that launch hand sanitizer product and directly marketed nationally through modern retail, networks, and marketplace. Culinary players are currently starting to switch to making ready to eat, ready to cook, and ready to drink products, as well as frozen food, which are marketed during concept of delivery, reseller concept, and reselling through the marketplace. Business survival depends on the entrepreneur's ability to identify opportunity. Related to opportunity recognition that has been explained by speaker, I think the most important for us is to think outside of the box. That is, will create new pathway to more inspiring business. For discovering entrepreneurial opportunities, I think it might be start from ourselves, for example, by starting business from hobby, seeing the potential around the place of residence, browse internet, read the book to see the business opportunities, meet old friends who has business, checking the business network, visit creative event, join in some communities to have cooperation or collaboration among entrepreneurs, reading news to know the current situation. Last but not least, COVID creates destruction of the current business models, but also brings many visible and hidden opportunities. On this occasion, I would like to thank to all our speakers, especially Dr. Tessi Mirales, Dr. Vicente Salvador Montano, Dr. John Viene Murcia, Mrs. Ratna Suminar, and Mrs. Fiftia. And finally, thank you to all who involved in organizing this event. We are truly grateful for your valuable contribution and attendance. Once again, thank you very much. That is my uh, Dean closing remarks. I give it back to the host. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much. Dagang salamat. Now, before we, you know, part our ways, may I request all the resource speakers and the guest discussant to please turn on your camera for picture taking. So, may, can I request we have a virtual photo op? Okay. So. Um, Technical, can we have a great view for our photo ops? So, Miss Isa, there you go. So please bear your best smile. And one, two, three, another one. One, two, there you go. So thank you very much once again. Salamat kasi and daghang salamat. Um, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salamat.
gonna cut me down I'm gonna send the floor, gonna drown them out This is brave, this is bruise, this is who I'm meant to be This is me Look out, this is here I go Oh, 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 oh,